Okay, good afternoon everyone. So, indeed, my name is Pierre Art, and I'll talk about the QCD phase diagram. Um, and I'll use lecture notes, which I put on the, um, on the archive, so you can read them if you want to. Five, one, four, five. Uh, so it's on the Hab Lattice archive. And uh, these notes actually also contain exercises uh, which we will discuss this week uh, in the afternoon sessions. So the exercises are also in these, in these lecture notes. Um, to know a little bit more about you, I actually want to know a bit about uh, you. So who here is a first year PhD student? Okay, so quite a lot actually, yeah, good. Second year, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. postdoc. Okay, so most people are first year students, good. And uh, the second question is, so I won't really talk about very difficult things in lattice QCD, but I'll use it every now and then a little bit. So, uh, who of you have, is working on lattice QCD, say? Only three, say? And who has uh, heard about lattice QCD? Oh, that's very good. <laughs> um, so, one motivation for this, uh, for this lecture time problem in QCD at non zero uh, baryon density. Um, but actually, by studying the sign problem, you learn a lot about QCD phase diagram in any case. So it will not be a lecture about the numerical problems of the sign problem, but more about the things you encounter when you think about, about it and ways to uh, avoid it. Um, and then, as uh, Jean-Paul said in the morning, please you know, ask questions when you have uh, questions, and I'll stop every now and then as well for, for questions. Um, okay, so what we'll do is the phase indeed, so we've already seen this in the morning, temperature, chemical potential, um, and we know that um, in low temperature we have hadrons, at high temperature we have the quark uh, gluon plasma, and there is a boundary in between, and this boundary is a crossover, so as mentioned in the morning, and may turn into a second order transition uh, and then a higher order, and then there's uh, further transitions at higher chemical potential. Um, so area down here may be relevant for neutron stars, uh, is relevant for neutron stars, and the area here is relevant for the early universe and for um, heavy ion collisions, especially at LHC. Now the question is, what do we actually know about the phase diagram? And it turns out we know very little really well and rigorously. So what we know is this part here. So we know that the physics along the temperature axis really well, and the reason is that we can do uh, simulations of lattice QCD, which is a non-perturbative formulation, first, first principle formulation. And so there we can do simulations um, and solve QCD non-perturbatively. So at, say, non-zero temperature and mu B very close to zero, also at zero temperature, and mu B very close to zero, we can use uh, lattice QCD. And so that's the first principle uh, numerical solution. Um, however, as soon as we go to non-zero non baryon density, we run into problems. Um, and the reason is that when the baryon density or the baryon chemical potential becomes larger than zero, and we're in this region here, I mean all the way up to, to here, we suffer from something called the sign problem, which limits the use of standard numerical methods. So at, say, mu b 
larger than zero, we have this so-called time problem and standard Monte Carlo methods can no longer be used. And so whenever somebody shows you a QCD phase diagram, um, you have to be aware that uh, whatever is plotted on this side is based on uh, module calculations, speculations, or um, wishful thinking. So that's an important ingredient as well. Um, so what I want to do in the, in the lectures is um, uh, talk you through... Um, so the motivation will be the sign problem. But while we discuss the sign problem, we will, you know, discover certain aspects of the, of the phase diagram. And so this, the structure of the letters I'll give, a, of, the letters, of the lecture is, uh, is as follows. So I'll say some general things about uh, quantum statistical mechanics, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, and talk about how we use chemical potential. And both in a continuum theory and on the, and on the, on the lattice. And then talk about uh, the problems you encounter. So uh, uh, problems related to the sign, the overlap, and the silver blaze problems. And I'll explain what all of these are. Um, and then talk about the, uh, some solutions that are available, namely, uh, say, the phase boundary at small mu. Small mu over t. And... Um, and spent quite some time also about talking about what's called imaginary chemical potential. Because this actually teaches us a lot about uh, the QC day phase diagram in a kind of very unexpected uh, way. Um, and then in the, in, the, in the last two lectures, we'll go to more uh, exploratory uh, ways to explore the phase diagram. Um, and in the last lecture, depending on how far I get, maybe we'll talk also about uh, um, spectral functions and correlators, so a little bit more to, to our spectroscopy rather than just the phase structure. And yeah, so this is the, uh, the general idea. Any questions so far? Good. Okay, so let's start with uh, quantum statistical uh, mechanics, just so we know what we're talking about. Um, so we study QCD at finite temperature, finite chemical potential, and so we use the uh, grand function. And just in general, it's the sum over all the states, and it's a function functions so with a Boltzmann weight is E minus U times N divided by the temperature, where uh, H is the uh, uh, and N is a conserved uh, quantum number. Uh, T is the temperature, of course, so T, are the, T and mu are the control that Jean-Paul referred to in the morning, temperature, 
chemical potential and in principle do the fine properly in a, a finite uh, volume which is taken to uh, infinity to take the thermodynamic limit. Um, so this is the, uh, the starting point. Um, so chemical potential is introduced for um, uh, because there are conserved quantum numbers and just to get all the definitions right, we can then, uh, so thermal quantities follow by a differentiation. I'm in particular interested in differentiating with respect to the chemical potential. And so this will give us the uh, particle density, particle, total particle, particle density, and is obtained by taking the derivative uh, of the logarithm of the partition from respect to mu. And I also define the particle density simply as n divided by mu. And if I differentiate one more time, um, you get the fluctuations of, of particle number. And so this is the susceptibility. Chi is uh, fluctuations of particle number. So expectation value of n squared minus expectation value of n squared. And it's made an intensive quantity by scaling it with the volume. And so this can also simply be obtained by differentiating particle density with respect to mu. Um, so these are things you know because this is a typical part, typically part of a, a second order, a second year course in statistical mechanics. Um, and we're doing nothing else in statistical mechanics here, but in a you know, complicated, strongly interacting uh, system. But in the end, we want to know uh, what is the baryon density in the system, uh, what, is the, what are the fluctuations of uh, of these uh, conserved quantities, etc. Um, now, I introduced chemical potential here. So I write, wrote it quite loosely uh, as mu, without actually saying what the chemical potential is and what the conserved number is the um, chemical potential couples to. And so there are a um, number of choices. So if we start with uh, with, so let's, for, let's take two waivers, just for simplicity. So we have up and down quarks. Then I can introduce chemical potential for each of the quark number density. So I can have a, a mu up, which couples to the uh, number of up quarks and u and I can have uh, chemical potential for the down quark density. Hmm. Difficult problem. And I can couple it to the number of uh, down quarks. And so I can take these chemical potentials to be the same or different. I have a, a lot of freedom here. Uh, now the standard uh, choice, of course, is to take them the same. So this will take as the first option, will take mu up equal to mu down, and we'll call this the quark chemical potential. So um, if I introduce a chemical potential for quark number, I get, uh, uh, I induce a density of quarks, and so the quark density is simply the sum of the number of up quarks plus the number of down uh, quarks like this. So that's the first uh, choice. Now, usually, actually, typically, when people draw the phase diagram, we talk about baryon chemical potential, not quark uh, chemical potential. Uh, but once you go into the calculations, quark chemical potential is much more natural because quarks are degrees of freedom. Uh, but these two are obviously related, and they are related uh, as follows. Well, so. Um, Baryon chemical potential uh, 
mu b. So who wants to know, who wants to guess the relation between baryon chemical potential and quark chemical potential? Three, yeah, so the factor three is important. And I can never remember, just like you, what is the factor of three or one over three. And so somehow the easiest way to remember it is to think about the definition of chemical potential as uh, the way Gibbs introduced it. When you do, you know, the Gibbs ensemble in statistical mechanics, um, the chemical potential is the amount of energy that is needed to add one more particle to the system. So if I want to add one baryon to the system, the amount of energy, the chemical potential would be mu b, but one baryon consists of three quarks. So if I want to add one baryon to the system, that's the same as adding three quarks, and so the baryon chemical potential is equal to three times the quark chemical potential. So it's the energy needed to add three quarks or a baryon to the system. Um, so that's, if you stop paying attention now, that's a really useful thing to remember. Um, so that's the uh, baryon chemical potential. And in the same way, the baryon density then is, um, so if I have uh, three quarks, so baryon density is the quark density over three. Because if I have one quark, say, I have one quark, I have one third of a baryon or I need three quarks to get one baryon. So that's uh, another relation. Um, but from now on, we always talk about quark chemical potential just because quarks are degrees of freedom. So that's the, uh, the quantity that enters. Okay, so this was one choice. I've chosen the same chemical potential for up the quarks and down quarks, and that will give me quark number density or baryon density. Um, but there are other choices to make, and these, these, you know, these, are not, um, these, these are encountered as well. So let me erase this. So I could choose something else. I could choose the chemical potential opposite. This is the second choice. Mu down is minus uh, mu up. Um, does anybody have an idea of what physical situation this corresponds to? Or what density I would induce if I introduce these chemical potentials? Say again? I couldn't hear you, but electric charge? electric charge? No, because what's, I mean, the up and the down quark have a different electric charge, two thirds minus one third. Mesons? Isospin, exactly. So this would induce uh, isospin, so I can call this mu isospin, uh, because the up quark and the down quark have opposite isospin. And so in this here, you would. If I have this chemical potential non-zero, I would induce an density, which is the number of minus the number of down quarks. Um, and this is um, um, also relevant for, for, uh, uh, for systems which they have more neutrons, they uh, uh, non-zero density of, of, uh, of, uh, of isospin. And then the third possibility would be uh, what you just uh, uh, mentioned already. I could choose a mu up to be two thirds of mu q and mu down minus one third of mu q. This is a charge, electrical charge. Uh, Uh, a chemical potential coupling to the electrical charge um, so that this type of uh, chemical potentials have a charge density which is equal to two thirds times uh, the up quark density minus one third times the down quark uh, density. 
Um, so this would uh, this is useful if you want to look at the uh, non-zero electrical uh, charge in the system. Now all of these follow you, these choices can be made. Not you know you don't have to make these choices beforehand because I simply have uh, mu up couples to n up plus mu couples to the down uh, quark density. Uh, and only at the end, so if I, as long as I keep these chemical potentials different, I can specialize later on and say, well, I want to keep take them the same. I have quark number density. I want to take spin density, or I want to take them proportional to two thirds or minus one third, and I get charge density. Um, so if I keep them different, I have all of these choices uh, to uh, to benefit from later on. Uh, but in this lecture here. And we'll focus on, uh, on uh, baryon density or quark density. And I'll call it mu q. And now, from now on, I will actually drop the mu and just call it the chemical potential. So it's always understood it's the uh, quark number chemical potential. OK, any questions about this? Yeah. Well, if you so uh, an up quark has plus a half isospin, a down quark is minus a half, so they have opposite isospin. So if I now if I coupled if I choose this potential chemical potentials to be opposite, I automatically get plus the up quark density minus the down quark density. So I automatically have a zero density of isospin. Okay, so this, these are the, the basic definitions. Um, so now we should be all set up really to just base diagram. And so the question is, um, why not? Why can't we just uh, go ahead? Um, and so now there's a short comment about lattice QCD. Um, okay, wrote the partition function as trace e to the as h minus mu n over t. So that's the, the definition. But as you know, we want to write this not as a, uh, as a trace over the Hilbert space, which is a difficult problem to solve. But we want to write this as a Euclidean integral. And so this Euclidean uh, path integral takes a form of an integral over all degrees of freedom. And so I write it like this, e to the minus s. Um, and so we have gluons and quarks. And so the path integral becomes sum over all configurations of gluon fields, which I call uh, u here, because this is using a lattice QCD formulation, but it's not really that, you know, it's not that relevant. So we have uh, the gluons and the quarks and antiquarks. And then they're weighted with the Boltzmann weight. And so the Boltzmann weight in the, uh, in the definition of the partition function becomes the Euclidean action. Um, which is an integral of a four dimension Euclidean space. Of the uh, of the uh, Euclidean Lagrange density, say. Um, so, who's familiar with the Euclidean path integral? Most people are okay. Um, so, the idea is that um, you think of this uh, exponential here as an evolution operator in imaginary time. Uh, so if we have in the normal quantum mechanics, we consider e to the i h t evolution operator. So we can write a path integral in terms of the uh, Minkowski uh, action. And in the path integral, you get an e to the i s. We now think about, uh, we take time to be Euclidean or uh, imaginary uh, so, in 
that we have an an, a weight which causes e to the minus the Hamiltonian over temperature, and this then corresponds to a, a Euclidean pass integral where the time extent or the imaginary time extent is given by 1 over the temperature. So the, the uh, evolution, say, in imaginary time runs from, one, from 0 to 1 over the temperature, um, and this extent is given because there's this 1 over temperature here in the exponent, just there is a, is a t here in the evolution operator. So this is a direct relation between uh, evolution in quantum mechanics and imaginary time in statistical uh, mechanics. But that's really all you need to know, basically. But I'm happy to answer questions if you have questions about it. Okay, so we have this, uh, this path integral formulation in terms of the Euclidean path integral. So what do we want to do with this? It's still quite a complicated uh, path integral. So we want to solve the, the path integral. Well, there are two ways to solve it, either in perturbation theory, um, but this is only valid if the coupling is small and the theory is perturbative. And so we want to, do, we want to solve the path integral non-perturbatively. Um, and the way to do that is to do it numerically. Um, now, I cannot do numerics on this particular expression here, it's still too complicated, uh, for a number of reasons, but one reason is that there is these, these Grassmann fields here. So the quarks are represented by Grassmann variables. Um, and I wouldn't be able to, uh, to do something with them, so the standard way is to integrate them out. And so the action has two components, the Young-Mills action, so these are the, are the gluons again. And then there is something schematically, uh, I'll write it as this, so the quark fields and they... Uh, and the, 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 this matrix in between the quark field is essentially the Dirac operator, in a very schematic fashion. Um, and this Dirac operator actually depends on the, on the gauge field, so let me write it like this. Um, but what's important is that the, 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 the Grassmann variables only appear in a quadratic fashion, and so it's a Gaussian integral, a Grassmann integral, I can integrate them out. And so in the end, I can write my partition function as an integral just over the gluonic fields with the Young-Mills action here. And then there's a determinant of the uh, Dirac operator depending on the, on the gauge fields again. So this is now, so we integrate out the quarks. And this leads to this determinant. Now this is an integral which I can do something with if I want to solve it, because this is purely a bosonic integral. It's very high dimensional, of course, um, because I have um, the gluon fields living on in this four-dimensional uh, space-time lattice. Um, but I can discretize it and put it on the computer and, and, uh, and solve it numerically. Now, how would I solve a very high-dimensional integral? If you can't do it analytically. The Monte Carlo, exactly. So I want to solve this uh, with Monte Carlo. Um, but in order to solve it with Monte Carlo, I need a positive weight. I need to say if every configuration of gluons, I have to be able to assign a weight to it and say whether this weight is important or not. So in other words, this combination here under the integral should be positive definite. So solve with Monte Carlo, so the weight 
and the weight here would be e to the minus the young mills action times the determinant the fermion matrix should be real and positive uh, because then I can assign a uh, so it's a probably it's a proper probability because then for each configuration of gluons I can say whether it's uh, important or not important and I can do uh, important sampling And now, as you can already guess, the difficulty is, of course, that this weight is not positive definite because at non-zero baryon, non-zero chemical potential, this, uh, this weight is complex. So what we'll show a little bit later in today's lecture is that, of course, this is not the case. And in fact, this determinant here satisfies the relation that uh, if I now indicate the quark so quark chemical potential appears in this determinant. If I indicate the quark chemical potential explicitly, if I take the complex conjugate of this, I don't find the same uh, determinant back. I find the determinant at minus mu back. So I flip the sign. And I put a complex conjugate here for uh, future convenience. Um, so if I'm at non-zero chemical potential, these two are not the same. So at mu not equal to zero, this determinant is a complex number. Um, and I cannot do impo important sampling. So I cannot do Monte Carlo uh, methods. Now this is... Um, uh, this is generally called the sign problem. And so we'll study various aspects of the sign problem in these, uh, in these lectures. At zero chemical potential, well, minus zero is zero. So at zero chemical potential, the determinant is real. And so if I, for instance, have, uh, say, two flavors, the determinant, I get something like the determinant of m squared for each of the flavors. And so it's not only real, it's real and positive. So I can do Monte Carlo simulations. There's no limitation. And that's, of course, what has been used in lattice QCD since the 1980s or so, is to rely on the fact that it's for zero chemical potential, the determinant is real um, and positive. If I say, if I have light flavors, I have two of them. And so I can do simulations. And so, uh, so Lattice QCD has explored this point here in the phase diagram to, you know, very great precision in the extent that the simulations that are currently being done at zero temperature uh, with physical quark masses and in the continuum limit. And also now this region here has been extremely uh, well studied. And so that relies on the fact that at zero mu, you have a positive probability weight. Yeah. So uh, this is like this specific. Yeah. OK, so the good question. So if you want, so let's say we're at zero mu, where everything works then you have to, uh, it's still a numerical problem, so you discretize the integral. Um, so let me write that here. Um, and so we have to do uh, nice. And the way that is done is that the gluonic fields, so I have space-time points, So say this is space, this is time, Euclidean time. And the way I do it is you put gluons on the links. So this is where these U live that I, just, that I keep writing. Um, and so you can write down your action as a sum of your lattice of these quantities 
of U's. So let me just write them as U, U, U dagger, U dagger in a very schematic fashion. Um, and this action is chosen in such a way that if you take the continuum limit, so that in the limit where this lattice spacing goes to zero, so this is the lattice spacing A here, that this becomes essentially uh, the field strength, S squared, so the Young-Mills action. So first of all, you discretize your system in such a way that in the continuum limit, zero lattice spacing, you recover the field strength, so you're simulating the right theory. Um, and then you have to simulate your theory at a number of different lattice spacings. So you take a sequence where you A, um, and then you extrapolate your result to zero lattice spacing. Now, this is easier said than done in a way because, of course, the lattice spacing has a dimension. And so how do I put something which is dimension full in a computer? And so the way to do that is to tune your uh, parameters in such a way that you uh, have your dimensionless numbers in the computer are chosen in such a way that you are reaching this continuum limit. The way this works is actually best explained at finite temperature. So let me explain how this works at finite temperature. So what, what was temperature in the Euclidean path integral? Temperature was this compact direction in the fourth dimension. So we had in the action, we had this integral from zero to one over the temperature, and then the volume integral as well. And so the temperature here is the, uh, the, uh, the circumference. So this is space, and this here is Euclidean time with boundary conditions. And the, the, the circumference of the circle is one over the temperature. If I now discretize it, so I have lattice spacing A here, and I have, uh, now suppose I have a number of points here. Suppose I have n tau points in the time direction. And I have uh, lattice spacing A. Then my temperature is given, so the circumference will then be n tau times A will be the circumference of the of this circle, number of lattice points times the lattice spacing. But that circumference is equal to one over the temperature because we're doing the Euclidean path integral. So whenever I've discretized it with some finite number of steps, I have, uh, I'm away from the continuum limit. If n tau here is some finite number, and I work at some temperature in, in MEVs or so, this will tell me what the lattice spacing is in inverse MEVs or in femtometers. And so the continuum limit is taken in such a way that I reduce the lattice spacing by increasing the number of points in the time direction in such a way that the temperature is kept fixed. And so what you often see as the continuum limit in uh, finite temperature studies is saying, so we keep T fixed in, say, MEVs. And then the continuum limit A to zero corresponds to taking the number of time points uh, to infinity. And so what you often see is there's some, some physical quantity and it's computed for a number of values of n tau and I can plot how it goes to zero as n tau goes to infinity. So suppose I have n tau equals uh, 8, so 1 over 8, 1 over 10, 1 over 12, 1 over 16, and I get some data points. And by making n tau larger, I'm getting closer to the continuum limit, so 1 over n tau smaller, 
I get some line here and I can extrapolate to the continuum limit. Um, so that's, of course, when you discretize something to solve it numerically, you always have to do this. And one way to do this at finite temperature is to, uh, to do this. So you increase the number of time points, which automatically means you reduce the letter spacing. Other questions? Yes, what about uh, the uh, odd number of flavors? Odd number of flavors, yeah, good question. Or different masses, because I guess yeah. if you have two talks with different masses. So, yeah. so, the heavier the quark is, the more positive the determinant is as well. So, the, the eigenvalues of the Dirac operator are shifted with the quark mass. And so, for, say, the strange quark or the charm quark, it typically doesn't happen that the determinant goes negative. Um, people, you know, I'm insulting people who've worked, made a career out of studying eigenvalues of the Dirac operator, but that's roughly what happens. If the quark mass is large enough, it's not only real, but it's typically also positive, and only for the very light quarks, so for the up and the down quark, you have to be careful, but there you have two flavors, so you square it away. That's roughly the situation. So this is safe there, yeah. Other questions? Okay, so we want to take the continuum limit. Um, okay, so we've reached a point now where we know with chemical potential, we know what chemical potential is, it couples to conserve number, and if we have it, we can compute number densities and susceptibilities and so on. Uh, we would like to solve the theory non-perturbatively, but we have a complex action problem or a sign problem, so we can't do it. Um, so let's, let's uh, talk a little bit more now about chemical potential, actually, and how we introduce it. So now we're going to introduce it properly. So far, I've only introduced it uh, loosely by saying it couples to the conserved quantum number, but let's now introduce it uh, properly. Actually, there's a whole story about taking the continuum limit, which is very beautiful because it's linked to the fact that QCD is asymptotically free. So there's, there's something called universality, which says as long as, I, as long as I'm in the same universality class, I can take any lattice action I want. And because the theory is asymptotically free, I can perturbatively de determine what these couplings are, and I will get the same uh, continuum limit. But that's a whole different lecture basically yeah. okay so uh, so let's talk about chemical potential a bit more um, and let's start very simple let's start with non-interacting fermions So what was the action integral from zero to one over temperature tau integral over space. So now I'm going to give the Dirac operator. So psi bar gamma nu d nu plus m yes, psi. So this is the standard uh, uh, Dirac action. I'm using nu for the indices rather than mu to avoid confusion. Um, so what is a conserved quantum number? Well, there is a symmetry. And the symmetry is just a phase symmetry. So psi goes to e to the l alpha psi. Psi bar goes to e to the minus i alpha psi bar. Like this. So this is a global symmetry. And if you have a global symmetry, there's a conserved uh, neutral current. And so the charge 
total charge is simply fermion number in this case. So D3x psi bar gamma 4 or gamma, did I call it gamma 4? Yeah, gamma 4 psi, which is the, the number density psi dagger psi. So that's the conserved uh, uh, charge, number density. Um, okay, I'm using Euclidean conventions for the, uh, for the gamma matrices, but that's in the lecture notes, it's not, not that important. And this is conserved, so it means that if I take the time derivative, d tau of this, it's zero. And you can use the equations of motion to show that. So this is relatively straightforward. So now we have the, uh, the particle uh, number. Um, so now let, we can go back to the partition function. And we can add it to the partition function. And it is, this is quite straightforward because what I want to add, e to the minus h minus mu and over the temperature. So one, what I want to add is this mu times n over t. And so mu times n over t. Well, n is, uh, is mu over t times d3x psi bar gamma 4 psi. Um, and I can actually write this in a slightly more seductive way by saying, well, this is independent of Euclidean time, so I can actually integrate over Euclidean time as well. Uh, because this is constant, this will just give you a, a 1 over t if I do this integral. And the 1 over t is exactly this, this factor here. So I can immediately write this uh, like a part of the Euclidean action. But now I integrate over four-dimensional space-time here. And, it's couple, and it's, uh, I'm integrating this particle density here. And so if I add this to the Euclidean action, I can now combine it with the other terms I have, 0 to 1 over the temperature, d tau, d3x, psi bar, gamma nu, d nu. Um, let me also add a, a gauge field just for fun, plus i a nu plus mu. Uh, gamma 4 plus m times psi, like this. So what have I done? I've taken the same action, the same Dirac action I had here. I've added this chemical potential, which appears in the partition function, which is a psi bar gamma 4 psi times mu, so I've added this term here, psi bar mu gamma 4 psi. And then I've also added a abelian field, and I'll explain in a minute why. So I've added an abelian gauge field there as well. And so this is now the whole Dirac operator, so I would write it as psi bar um, uh, psi. So why did I introduce this abelian uh, uh, gauge field? Well, if you look closely, then you see that if I take this, the fourth component of this field, A4, uh, then mu basically Combine, you know, mu goes with gamma 4, and so mu basically looks like an abelian gauge field in the fourth direction, but an imaginary one or a complex one. So that's the first observation. Mu is like uh, the four, fourth component of an abelian 
of an imaginary abelian uh, gauge field. Um, so if I would choose uh, A4 to be uh, minus I times mu, I would have chemical potential. So that's one, uh, one connection which you may not have been aware of before. And this, this, this notion will become important a little bit later when we introduce chemical potential in the lattice action. So that's one thing to note. Uh, the second thing to note is that this action is actually complex. So um, I said that the weight is not uh, positive definite, uh, or the weight in the potential function is, is, uh, is complex. And this is something we can see from this expression already. Um, so this has nothing to do with, with uh, uh, the lattice or something. This is already true in the non-interacting case in the in the continuum. So how can, we, uh, how can we see this? This goes under the name of gamma 5 hermeticity. So let's write down what the Dirac operator is. It is uh, gamma nu d nu plus i gamma nu a nu plus mu comma four plus m. And what I want to do now is to uh, commute this Dirac operator with, with gamma five. And so let's compute um, Uh, how shall I do it? So I want to, okay, I want to compute gamma five and gamma five. And let's do this first that mu is equal to zero. Let's see what happens. So on the end, I commute the Dirac operator with, with gamma five, uh, or conjugated. So when I take gamma five through, okay, and gamma five anti-commutes with the gamma matrices. Um, so gamma five, gamma nu, minus gamma nu gamma five. So let's start with the first term here. So if I take uh, uh, gamma five through, I get one, uh, I get, yeah, exactly, I get a minus sign. Huh? I get uh, one minus sign here, and then gamma five, I also have a, so my gamma five squares are equal to one. And so if I take it through here, I get one minus sign. So I get minus gamma nu d nu. Uh, and here I get the same, minus i gamma nu a nu. Let's do it for general mu. We can do it in one go. If I do it here, I get another minus sign, gamma 5, as I can use with gamma 4. So I get minus mu uh, gamma 4. Uh, and here I just, so M is a scalar, so here it just commutes, so I get plus, plus M. Uh, but as you, if you look closely now, then it turns out that uh, this is actually equal to M dagger, were it not that I've written down the mu. 
term here. So let's take mu equals zero again. Uh, this expression is actually equal to m uh, dagger. So for the mass, it's equal to c because it's just a real number. Here, the i goes to minus i if I dagger it. So uh, if I do it here, sorry, I get a minus. So that's uh, also m dagger. And then d, of course, d new dagger is minus d new. It's the anti-Hermitian operator. Huh? So i times d is a Hermitian operator. Um, and so, in other words, we find that at zero mu, gamma 5 m gamma 5 is equal to, to m dagger. Just, you know, continuum, free fermion, or system. Any questions about this? Yeah? Uh, gamma 4 is one of the four gamma matrices in the... Ah, okay, I use Euclidean convention, so it's gamma zero. Yeah. But I'm used to working in Euclidean time, like here, so I label everything from one to four. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, so we find, found this. Why is this... Uh, useful? Because... <laughs> very high, isn't it? So now I can take, compute the, uh, the determinant so I find that the determinant of gamma 5 m gamma 5 is the determinant of m dagger and the determinant of a conjugate of a matrix is uh, complex conjugate of the determinant, and here I can use the cyclicity, so this is the same of the determinant of m times gamma 5 squared, which is the determinant of, of m. And so at zero mu, we now find that the determinant of, of m is equal to the determinant of the, comp to, to, to its complex conjugate, and so the determinant of m is indeed real. Um, so this was at zero mu. If I now introduce mu up here, which I have erased, if I introduce mu here as plus mu gamma 4, so I get minus mu gamma 4 if I uh, conjugate it with gamma 5. And now I take the complex conjugate, it will still be minus mu. So I don't get plus mu back. And so at non-zero mu, This relationship breaks down, and I find that gamma 5 m mu uh, gamma 5 is equal to m dagger of minus mu. And I took the complex conjugate, so for completeness, I also conjugate this uh, mu, mu uh, chemical potential. And I have to put the minus sign in because this taking the complex conjugate does not give me the same sign of mu as I had before. And so at non-zero mu, I find the relation that the determinant of mu, uh, how did I write it? The determinant of mu star is equal to the determinant of m minus mu star. So this is a a complex number in general. So this is called gamma 5 hermeticity or absence of gamma 5 uh, hermeticity. Now, one thing to note, which you may say, what if I take the chemical potential to be purely imaginary, then everything is fine because if this is like I times mu, taking the complex conjugate, the I minus I will take away the minus sign. So just as a Interesting comment, if I take mu to be i times mu imaginary, the determinant is real.
And although it looks like a kind of interesting observation, but not really related, in fact, this is extreme, has been extremely useful in the past 15 years or so to study the QCD phase diagram by extending the phase diagram also to imaginary mu. And, uh, and we'll spend one lecture talking about the phase diagram in this extended space and how it impacts the phase structure at zero, at, at positive, at real mu as well. So that's one comment. So we'll come back to this later. And another comment which you could have asked is, um, so I said mu is like uh, the fourth component of a gauge field. And actually, I could use that and could just gauge the chemical potential away. If I would change my abelian gauge field by an amount i times mu or minus i times mu, I could get rid of it. So in abelian So mu can be removed in an abelian gauge theory. by uh, redefining A4, essentially. Um, so this is, this is also kind of interesting thing to remember. It's no longer true in, the, in, SU, in the SU3 or so. And we have a short break in a minute. So just really in two minutes. So one thing, so one of the exercises uh, on, the, uh, on the exercise sheet is to work all of this out for sonic theories. So this was obviously for a fermion theory. So what about bosonic theories? And why should we even be interested in it? Well, often the sign problem is called the fermionic sign problem. And um, it's traced back to the fact that fermions are anti-commuting variables, so they're Grassmann variables. So, so this is a statement that is often made to say the sign problem has to do with, uh, with Grassmann variables and anti-commuting Uh, variables. Um, well, this is true in some sense. If you have certain formulations of uh, fermionic theories, the sign problem comes in if you want to keep track of the gold lines of fermions. In this case, it's not um, because uh, here we saw that when mu is equal to zero, the determinant is, is, is actually real. So there is still this sign you know, it's not positive definite, so that's linked to the anti-commuting nature, but that can be resolved by, by, by squaring it. Um, so this sign problem here is really due to the, uh, the non-zero density. And so that's why it's useful also to study, say, phi to the fourth theory as a, obviously, bosonic theory. And it's, it's, let's take the complex uh, field and then we can, uh, we have a conserved current. We have a global symmetry. Phi goes to e to the i alpha times phi. So again, there's a global uh, symmetry. And so there's a conserved uh, number density. And so we can also introduce uh, chemical potential here. Uh, so we have an action at, at, at non-zero chemical potential coupled to this conserved number density. And so one of the exercises is to work, work this out for, uh, for, for phi to the fourth theory, and you will find that the same symmetry holds, namely that if I take the complex conjugate of the action, I get the action at minus uh, mu star. So it has exactly the same property as the determinant. Um, and, and lots of other things I'm going to say in the next lecture also apply to the bosonic theory. So it's quite nice to, to work it out in, the, in just in phi to the fourth, because we all, we all love phi to the fourth theory. So it's, 
good to work on that. Okay, we have a three minute break now then. Um, and so there are a number of other kind of problems that appear and they're all linked to the, to the sign problem. And they're not just problems because they are mathematically difficult or um, numerically difficult, but they also point to some interesting physics. So it's useful to, to discuss them. And so one of those is what's called the silver blaze problem. Um, I won't explain why it's called like that, but it's, there's a paper by Tom Cohen. I think it's around 2000. Uh, well, I can look it up when it is actually. Did I reference 14? Well, it's in the lecture notes. But anyhow, if you want to know why it's called the Silver Blaze problem, you can. 2003. So you can look it up why it's called the uh, Silver Blaze problem. So it, it, I would you know, discuss it a little bit now because it will become clear why this is an interesting problem and how it's linked to the sign problem, actually. Um, so, so we're going now, well, I'm too strong, towards uh, the silver blaze problem. And this goes back to this, what I said, uh, this physical intuition. You know, what is the chemical potential? It's the free energy needed when you want to add one particle into the system. Um, and so it has a very nice physical interpretation. And so, in other words, if... Um, so mu is equal to the uh, change in free energy when you add a particle with the right quantum numbers, namely those quantum numbers that correspond to this conserved charge. Uh, when you add a particle with the right quantum numbers to the system. So that's the, the kind of physical meaning of the chemical uh, potential. So it's the energy cost per particle. And the particle has the conserved, carries the conserved charge. So a charged particle, sorry. Now, two things can happen. One, if, if the uh, chemical potential is uh, not high enough. So if you say you want to increase, you increase the chemical potential now, uh, but if you don't have enough uh, energy to add a particle, then uh, nothing will happen. So if you have less than m, so this particle had uh, uh, mass m, then uh, nothing happens. And so the ground state is unchanged. Whereas the chemical potential, if you increase the chemical potential uh, a lot and is larger than this, um, than the mass of the particles which carry the conserved uh, charge, then it's very easy to actually create particles. And so this corresponds to a, a non-zero density. Of particles in the ground state. Now this is something you know very well because this is both Einstein condensation for instance. I have, uh, in the free field, the critical chemical potential for both ions and condensation is, is exactly this. Um, so the same happens uh, here. And already for free fermions, you can see this. It's kind of uh, trivial, but it will turn out to be non-trivial then when we extend it to, uh, um, when we relate it to the sign problem a little bit later on. Um, so let's look at this for free fermions, how this comes about in practice. Uh, so for free fermions, I can write down the, uh, the partition function or the free energy. 
very easily. So the log of the partition function is given by uh, the integral over all the momentum modes. And then there is the Uh, this comes by, I'm calling it beta in my notes, and let's write it as beta. Plus, and then there's the contribution from the particles and the antiparticles, minus beta omega p minus mu, plus, plus log 1 plus e to the minus beta omega p plus mu. Right on the next line. Well, I can't really read it myself, so let alone you. So plus log 1 plus e to the minus beta omega p plus mu. So this is the uh, free energy or the log of the partition function for, uh, for free fermions. So it's Proportion to the volume, there's a factor two here for spin. Um, beta, I used to, beta is one over the temperature here. And there is the zero point energy. And then there is the contribution from particles and antiparticles or particles with opposite conserved charge. So there's a minus mu here and a plus mu there to distinguish particles with plus charge and minus charge. That's the conserved uh, number. So this is what you, uh, uh, what you get when you do uh, yeah, quantum statistical mechanics for, uh, for fermions. Um, and so we can compute the particle density uh, easily by differentiating log z with respect to the chemical potential we defined in the beginning, so this is the particle density. And so when you differentiate this, um, so the zero point energy drops out and you have these two uh, logs here. And when you differentiate them, you get one over these combinations and one plus the exponent will give the Fermi Dirac distribution. So there will be two contributions here. Which are the the difference between the two Fermi Dirac distributions. Plus one for the particles and then e to the beta omega p plus mu over t for the antiparticles. So this, the density of particles is simply the density of uh, particles minus antiparticles which have the opposite uh, charge. So this makes uh, complete uh, sense, this expression. It's intensity, it is intensive, it's the density, and it's, there's a factor of two for spin. So now let's look at this, uh, these densities, this particle density in the low temperature limit. Let's take now the limit where the temperature goes to uh, zero. And based on this idea that, oh yeah, so what's omega p? Omega p is the uh, this relativistic dispersion relation. So based on this notion that uh, chemical potential is the energy required to add a particle, we said there must be a difference when the uh, chemical potential is less than the mass of the particle or more than the mass. And so that's exactly what we're going to see now. Um, so let's first take the case that uh, mu is less than m. Um, if mu is less than m, well, both of these exponents here, so here is square root of p squared plus m squared plus mu. This is always positive here. And so at low temperature, t goes to zero. This is a very high number, so we can ignore the one. And the same here, actually, because the uh, mu is less than m, this combination, the exponent, yeah? Yeah, so beta is here. Ah, and also one over t. No, no, it's a bit too much, indeed. Yeah, thanks. Um, 
Yeah, thanks. Only beta. So also here, when uh, mu is less than m, and this is square root of p squared plus m squared, this is always a positive number. So if I take t to 0, beta to infinity, this is a large number, and I can drop to 1. So in this case, the particle density uh, goes as 2 times d3p. Um, so I can ignore the 1 here, so I essentially get e to the minus beta omega p minus mu. And the same for the other one, minus e2 minus omega p plus mu. And if I take really the temperature to limit, uh, the limit of the temperature to zero, beta to infinity, this will go to zero, because both of these are exponentially small. So if I am in this uh, regime where mu is less than the mass, the particle density will go to zero. At small temperatures, there will be some particles there, but they are Boltzmann uh, suppressed. On the other hand, when mu is larger than m, this argument breaks down. It's still th true for, these, uh, for, for the antiparticles. It is still positive. But here I now have the case that if mu is larger than m, then for some values of the momenta, this will actually be negative here. And so this will not go to infinity and will not go to zero when you put it in the uh, numerator. And so... If I now am at strictly zero temperature, I have to look at whether omega p is larger than mu or smaller than mu. And when omega p is smaller than mu, this goes into a step function. This is the, the limit whether the Fermi-Dirac uh, distribution function at zero temperature goes to the, uh, to the step function as a function of energy. And that limit happens when uh, omega uh, sub p is uh, smaller than, uh, than mu. So the integral then uh, becomes uh, 2 times d3p over 2p cube. And this becomes a step function when um, uh, mu is larger than omega p or omega p is less than mu. So it's like this. Um, and so we can carry out the integral here. So this will be something like uh, 2 times 4 pi divided by 8 pi cube. And then we get an integral from 0 to infinity dp p squared. And we get a step function here, which is basically uh, depending on p squared plus m squared uh, should be less than mu squared, so that will fix the upper boundary of the integral. And if you carry out the integral, then you get 1 over 3 mu squared times mu squared minus m squared to the 3 halves. And this only works when mu is less than m. And so now we have this non-zero density of particles, so this is this uh, condensate of, of fermions. And so if we plot the density, that's not a condensate of fermions, but it's a non-zero density of fermions. If we plot this against mu, then there is zero density for chemical potential less than the mass, and then it rises uh, in this square root fashion like this. And it goes as mu cube for large, uh, for large mu. Now, the reason I'm telling you is that this region here is actually the region that is really interesting, surprisingly, from the viewpoint of the sign problem. Namely, if you do the sign problem wrong somehow, if you don't take it into account, if you do your numerical simulations and somehow you forgot about the sign problem, you will not get zero density here. So this is a, an extremely important test for your numerical simulations 
to see whether you reproduce this kind of basic physics, which um, you know follows from constant statistical mechanics. There's nothing mysterious about it, but the fact that the density here is zero is kind of the ultimate uh, referee of your numerical algorithm to be able to do simulations with a complex weight. So, uh, so this is uh, that's the reason I'm telling you this. So we'll come back to this also, also later. Um, okay. Any questions about this? Okay. So. Maybe I should do this now. So let's, I want to now go to the, to explore the third problem related to this. So this is the fact that this density should be zero here is what's called the silver blaze problem. And we'll come back to that. We have the sign problem, uh, but there is a third problem, which is also related to that, but that's something you, you encounter as well. So I'm skipping one section here. And this is the overlap problem. And this will bring these various aspects uh, together. So this will link up the sign problem, the silver blaze problem, and in general the problems you encounter. Uh, and we'll teach you some physics as well. So let's do something uh, which looks like uh, a fantastic idea. So we take the partition function. e to the minus young mill, determinant of m. And suppose we want to do, uh, we want to stick with important sampling. Now, does anybody have a suggestion how to make this uh, weight real and positive? What could I do to it? How could I? Very easy to make something real and positive. Say again? Exactly. Put the module in. Take the absolute value. That's exactly what I was looking for. So, a very simple solution. Put the module in. Modulus. So, I'm writing the determinant of M as the absolute value times a phase. I mean, nothing is easier than that. Um, and then I can do say, well, I'm going to forget about the phase for a minute. I'm going to just interpret this as the, as the weight. And I'll include the phase a little bit later to make, to make up for it. So if I do this, put back later, then um, this is called uh, phase, phase quenching for obvious reasons because I'm I'm quenching the phase of the determinant. So let's see whether this is a, a good idea or not. So I can, um, I can rewrite my uh, partition function, my observable as follows. So O here is some observable. So I'm doing statistical mechanics. So it's du e to the minus s determinant m times O. And I normalize it with the partition function. Like this. And now I'm going to do exactly what you suggested. I'm going to put in the modulus and write the phase separately. So du e to the minus s young males, determinant of m, absolute value, e to the i phi times o. And now I'm going to decide, well, actually, I'm going to reinterpret this, and I'm going to say this is like doing a measurement in a theory with a real and positive weight, both in the numerator and the denominator. 
Um, and what I'm computing in this series is the expectation value of either e to the i phi or e to the i phi times the observable. So I can reintroduce, reinterpret this now as the expectation value of e to the i phi times the observable divided by the expectation value of e to the i phi. But in the theory where I simulate with the absolute value, and I'm calling that the phased quenched theory. So PQ stands for phase quenched, and that has a weight um, e to the minus s young mills absolute value after the determinant, which is you know real and positive. And I've multiplied numerator and denominator by the phase quenched partition function. Uh, so if I define the partition function, if I define observable, I also have to normalize it with the partition function. So I've normalized these with the partition function of the phase quenched theory, which is, is this one. Any questions about this? So this is, this is uh, uh, algebra, but it's very straightforward. Nothing has happened here. So I haven't done anything, anything wrong here. It's just uh, rewriting and reshuffling. So let's see how far we can get here. So if I want to evaluate now the observable, let's call this the observable in the full theory, um, I have to compute both of these expectation values here in the phase quench theory and take the ratio. Both of these are well defined. Both of these can be computed with Monte Carlo simulations because they have a real and positive weight. So it's all looking fantastic. Let's see if that's really the, the case. So we need to compute say O e to the i phi in the phase quench theory and e to the i phi in the phase quench theory. And these are all uh, well defined. So they should all be all be good. So let's take a bit closer look at this. So what is e to the i phi in the phase quench theory? Um, well, I just write out this definition. It's the expectation value in the theory with the absolute value normalized by the phase quench partition function. So it's determinant of m times e to the i phi normalized by the partition function in the phase quench theory, like this. So again, this is just uh, following definitions. Now, what is the line on the top? What is that? It's on the upper board. It's the original partition function. It's the partition function I started with. So this is, let's call it now the full partition function. And this is normalized with the phase quenched partition function. So this expectation value of this phase is actually the ratio of two uh, partition functions. Now, how can I write a partition function? I can write it as a free energy density. So I can say I can write it as e to the minus free energy over temperature, or if I introduce the volume e to the minus v over t times the uh, free energy density. And in the same way, the phase quench theory would be the free energy or free energy density pq. 
So I can write this as uh, free energies. And so if I use this way of writing it, and this average phase is actually e to the minus, and it's v over t, and the difference of the free energy, so let's call it delta f, where delta f is the difference of the free energy in the theory I'm interested in, and the theory which has the phase quenched uh, weight. Can you see a problem now if I want to use this method? Exactly. If I take the thermodynamic limit and I take the volume to infinity and or the temperature to zero, this is actually exponentially small. So this ratio is exponentially small in the thermodynamic limit. And this is uh, another manifestation of the sign problem. And one reason why sometimes it's said that the sign problem is exponentially hard. Um, because if you want to measure this phase, this ratio of phases here in a simulation which is well defined, you need exponentially precise precision in order to make, uh, to make this ratio here. So this, although I'm not a big fan of it, because, okay, anyhow, but this is uh, somehow the, the statement that the sign problem is exponentially hard. And so there are some uh, papers out there that uh, relate the sign problem than to problems that are uh, NP hard um, because it requires this exponential uh, precision. What it does say is that probably there's no generic solution to the sign problem um, because suppose you can solve this exponentially hard problem in a generic fashion, you would also be able to solve these NP-hard problems in a generic fashion, which is quite unlikely. Um, um, but that only accounts for, say, generic solutions. So it doesn't, of course, rule out that in some theories or some problems, you can do with some other formulation which uh, makes you solve this, uh, this problem. Anyhow, the standard uh, way to look at this is that the sign problem, if you do it in this way, is exponentially hard which means that your measurements need exponentially precise results in a thermodynamic limit and at zero, at zero temperature. Questions? Now, it turns out that this is not just a mathematical rewriting, but actually there's some, uh, some really nice physics related to this, and that has, is related to this uh, silver blaze feature and this onset of a non-zero density of particles. Um, so let me come to that, to that now. And so for this, we have to look a little bit more at what the phase quenched theory actually, actually means. So, so far we just uh, said, well, let's ignore the phase, let's take the modulus, and that defines the phase quenched theory, but actually it's a theory on its own. It's a theory um, that we could actually study and has completely different physics compared to QCD at non-zero baryon density. So what is the phase quench theory? And I'm going to use two flavors here just because it makes it nice and easy. And so I have, and let's say they're degenerate, so I have, originally I have uh, the determinant squared, say two flavors. Now, if I'm going to ignore the phase here, and I'm going to take the modulus, then that is essentially the same as taking 
one determinant times its complex conjugate. So this would be that mu of m times that m, sorry, complex conjugate. Huh? So I have two factors here. I take one times this complex conjugate. That gives me the determinant of m squared with the absolute value. So that's the phase quench theory. Um, but what do we know about this determinant? What is the determinant of m with, when you take the complex conjugate? What does it correspond to? Minus exactly, minus the chemical potential. So this is actually equal to the determinant of m with positive chemical potential times the determinant of m um, with, neg with minus the chemical potential based on these relations we derived earlier. <clears throat> so now I have two chemical potentials, one plus mu, one minus mu. What does that correspond to? Isospin. So I've actually now have a theory where I have non-zero isospins. So I started with a trick where I just ignored the phase by taking the absolute value, but it turns out that if I do that, I'm actually simulating a theory not at non-zero burial chemical potential with some trick, but I'm actually simulating QCD at non-zero isospin density. So it's a completely different theory. Now suppose that I'm at very low temperature, so I'm looking at T going towards zero. Um, what do we know what happens at, at very low temperature, zero temperature when I increase the chemical potential, well, I get a non-zero density of particles because we've just demonstrated that. So what happens if I take, do this here in this theory with non-zero isospin? What particles will condense then? Which particles will condense? So what is the lightest particle with non-zero isospin? Pion. So if I do this, I get pion condensation. At mu isospin equals the light at equals to the mass of the particle with the conserved charge I'm looking at, and that's the pion. So I get pion condensation once the chemical potential reaches the pion mass. So if I do this, I suddenly end up studying a theory with non-zero isospin, isospin, and I get condensation at the, uh, at when the chemical potential reaches the value of the pion mass. Um, since I'm looking at quark chemical potentials and not baryon or meson chemical potential, and a pion has two quarks, Actually, it's m pi over 2, but that's just, a, uh, just for bookkeeping. However, I want to study QCD with, say, mu quark or mu baryon. So where do I want to really see condensation? At what critical chemical potential? What value plays a role here? Which mass, which channel is the one that is important? Say again? Proton mass, exactly. I want to find condensation of nucleons because I'm looking at baryon chemical potential and the light is baryon, it's the, nu it's the nucleon. So we want uh, 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 we want to have uh, we want to find uh, nuclear matter. And so we really are interested in a chemical potential which is on the order of the nucleon mass. And again, since I'm not looking at baryons but at quarks, it should be the nucleon mass over three. So I find pion condensation, but I'm actually I'm interested in the onset of nuclear matter at uh, a chemical potential which is on the order of the nucleon mass over three. Now, in QCD, these values are very different because the pion is, say, 140 MeV. So this corresponds to, uh, say, 70 MeV. 
uh, whereas the nucleon is, say, 900 MeV, so this corresponds to 300 MeV. So I'm getting pion condensation at, say, 70 MeV, whereas I only want this condensation at 300 MeV, so I have this huge uh, range of chemical potentials where I have a complete uh, mismatch. So if I draw that here, I find that... Um, If I put mu, put mu here, so if I'm at very low temperature here, and I do I study the phase quench theory or the theory of non-zero easel spin, I find that I get pi condensation at say over two here. So I'm having a phase here where there is on this side of the line there is pi on condensation. However, I really want to study QCD where I get condensation, say, around a nucleon over three over here. So I should get, say, nuclear matter on this side here. And so in this whole region here, the phase quench theory gives the, the, the it simulates an interesting physical theory, but it's the, it is the wrong one. Now, how can, this, uh, how can this be? Are there any questions so far? So how can this be? This is exactly because of this overlap problem that we discussed here. Um, over here. This is exactly because of this overlap problem. So I'm simulating one theory So if you have your, uh, somehow your space of configurations, or think about statistical mechanics, I have some partition function which is peaked around some, some uh, uh, most likely uh, uh, configurations, then I'm simulating here, so this would say be the phase quench theory, and all my important configurations which contribute a lot uh, are down here, and this will lead to pion condensation, but I'm actually interested in, in, uh, in, uh, in full QCD here, so in uh, QCD with baryon chemical potential, where the most important configurations are somewhere else. And these uh, configurations have essentially nothing in common with each other. Um, and that's, that's characterized by saying that they don't have any overlap. And so this, uh, the ratio of the partition functions goes to zero. Uh, exponentially. So there is essentially no overlap between the dominant configurations in QCD with uh, mu isospin and QCD with mu baryon. Uh, no overlap in the, in, in the statistical sense, say. And this overlap shows up, this overlap problem shows up that, okay, mathematically, uh, the, the overlap goes to zero exponentially, um, and physics-wise, it means you get uh, completely different condensates or, or densities uh, appearing. Now, if I now, say, plot the density as a function of mu, say, either isospin density or, or baryon density, then I would find this very similar as to the thing I've erased now, like in the free fermion gas, I drew the onset, the density is zero up to the point where I reach onset and then it goes up. So in the phase quench theory, again, the density is zero up to the point uh, where I reach the pion mass. So this would be the density of uh, easel spin. Whereas in real QCD, I should have a density rising here and B. So this would be um, 
nucleon over 3. And so if I insist that I want to use the phase quench theory to study full QCD, I need to completely wipe out the density of pions here up to this point here. And that turns out is a real obstacle when you do numerical uh, calculations. And so this region here between here and here is called the, uh, the silver blaze region. Because what you want to see is nothing. You want to see nothing happening, no density of, of baryons, because I'm still below onset. But if you do it wrong, if your simulations do not capture the sign problems correctly, you will see an onset of something. And that's a sign that you, you've done something wrong. Um, so that's the, uh, the, the interesting challenge in a way that if you do numerical simulations, you want to get this region right. The region here, of course, this region is trivial because here there is no density, both if you have non-zero isospin and non-zero baryon number, um, because in any case, the chemical potential is not large enough to, uh, to make something uh, non-zero. So this region is the boring region. This region is the really interesting well, this region is also boring from the viewpoint of baryon chemical potential, but nothing is happening. However, if you want to go from here to here, <laughs> you somehow have to make it through this region without your algorithms breaking down. So this is the, the ultimate, uh, ultimate test, so to speak. Um, that's about what I wanted to say about that, I think. Ah, yeah, now remember, I knew I wanted to say something else. So one way to look at the severity of the sign problem is to plot simply this phase factor in the phase quench theory. We know it will go to zero exponentially, but sometimes if you're in a finite volume, maybe you're doing well, you know, maybe this factor is not that large, maybe uh, this is not that small. Um, and so one way to look at the severity of the sign problem is to plot this average phase factor in the phase quench theory as a function of mu. And maybe it's, you know, one would be the best case, which means that it's, uh, uh, nothing's happening. And maybe it won't be that small. However, in the thermodynamics, you know exactly what's going to happen. Um, so in the limit that t goes to zero and the three volume goes to infinity, um, you know what's going to happen because up to m pi over two, there's no onset in either theories. So they are identical. So delta F is zero here because the full and the phase quench theory are the same. And so the average phase factor is one. But then as soon as I reach m pi over two, I get onset in this theory, which I actually don't want. And so the free energy start to differ. And so in the thermodynamic limit, it goes to zero. So this is again m pi over two. And so if you look at it this way, uh, the, the sign problem is, is completely absent in, for these values of chemical potential and then becomes exponentially hard in this, in this region here. And so there are, you know, there, you can play around with trying not to use the phase quench theory but something else and to find a, uh, uh, a way to, uh, to simulate a theory but this is as small as possible. So you can get somewhere with on a small volume, say. Okay, that was about this bit. Any questions about this? Yeah. Exactly, that's that's a very good point. Yeah. Indeed. So for real key so these are quite far apart. Um, but indeed, if you people do simulations with uh, unphysical quark masses, and then these become closer and get closer and closer together. And indeed, what you see then is that the sign problem gets milder and milder. So actually, um, it does tell you something, but unfortunately it's in the regime where really the quark masses are so heavy that it doesn't really give you insight into the region of QCD you really want to know something about. Um, so there are approaches, um, well, you approximate the fermion determinant in, uh, by treating the quarks as being heavy. So you do, for those who know, you do kind of a hopping expansion, which you can do for heavy quarks. And then you can actually do simulations. The sign problem is mild, which means this is close to one. 
but essentially what you're doing is that these regions are almost overlapping here. So there's, there's uh, not, not a real interesting range to study here, but it's true. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's five o'clock. This is a good point to stop as it happens as well. Okay, thanks for today.